Okay, welcome to uh, part 8F. <laughs> uh, the Church of Laodicea, we're almost there. We only have like a half a dozen more sermons on it. <laughs> uh, Revelation 3.20 is a famous verse. Uh, it's used in uh, lots of evangelism tracts uh, to tell people that Jesus wants a relationship with them. Uh, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Uh, there's just a lot of good theology in there. And by theology, I mean uh, information about God and his ways uh, and how they affect us. So I wanted to uh, spend time uh, looking at this verse uh, in a little more detail uh, so you really understand it. Uh, first of all, it's not addressed to uh, unbelievers. These are people in the Church of Laodicea. They are believers, but they have excluded Jesus from their lives. And uh, we're going to talk about free will and uh, response and really what it means to have uh, Jesus in your heart and how that happens and how it doesn't happen. This is a famous... Uh, picture uh i there's no handle on the outside from what i have heard and uh notice that the weeds and thorns and everything have grown up around it so uh it's one of the symptoms of uh uh not, not painted the, the cares of this world is that uh the weeds grow up and overpower the word and that really was the case at Laodicea. Uh, they did not lead an examined life. Um, I, the artist, I should have figured out who he was. It's He's bringing light into the world. Uh, people are living behind the door in their darkness. Uh, and as a result, they don't have the light that gives them life. Uh, they can't examine their lives. Uh, my friend Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And it's really true. And we, we live in a culture where there's so little time to uh, actually think about our lives and examine them. Uh, you know, back then they didn't have Instagram, so they had a whole lot more time. Uh, but you really do need to take time and ask the question, uh, which actually uh, someone had shared in praise time of, you know, why do we do what we do? And a corollary, which I was not sure in that sermon from last year at this time, uh, why don't we do what we don't do? And uh, it all comes down to a set of values, and uh, we do what's important to us, and because we think it's important to us, we actually do it. But we're going to see that uh, the Laodiceans were deceived, um, and they thought they were doing great, and they were doing so poorly that uh, Jesus said, you know, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. There's like, we don't have a relationship. Yet he wants a relationship with them. And uh, the testimony to God's grace and love that even to those who are repulsive in his sight, he still wants a relationship with them. And they're repulsive in his sight because they're you know, serving themselves and Satan in this world, living in sin. Sin has two parts, uh, you know, actually committing sin and then omitting the important stuff. And the big biggies are uh, the omissions and people tend to just focus on the commissions. I'm not doing that, so I'm okay. But no, Jesus does not think very highly of people who don't uh, listen and obey. So, uh, the sermon in the picture, but let's go back to you who are more textually based. Uh, the previous church, Philadelphia, was the best church. So, on all these letters, there was a, with the exception of these last two, uh, a condemnation, uh, and a commendation and uh, the philadelphia church uh, just gets blessings um, god commends them uh, for what they're doing and opens a door for them uh, to escape the future tribulation and here we have a door it's closed the laodiceans are not going to escape it they're going to uh, experience it because they are uh, worthy of it so the laodicean church was the worst it, it's the only church without a commendation. Jesus was able to find something nice to say about every other church. Um, but in his omniscience, 
uh, he couldn't come up with anything nice to say. <laughs> it was nothing uh, about them that was commendable in his sight. Yet, uh, here he still seeks a relationship with them. Uh, even though they were proud, Satan's downfall, carnal, sinning, and born-again believers. These are not unbelievers. The solution is not, believe that I died for your sins. The solution is, let me into your life um, so I can help it become what it was intended to be. The unexamined life is not worth living, according to Socrates, because it... it uh, basically just reacts, he doesn't use these words, to, to what's around them. Uh, it doesn't t t tap into its purpose, and, and thus it has really no meaning. Um, thus, he's able to conclude it's not worth living. Uh, Christ is outside the person. Now, when you're born again, the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ actually comes into your heart, but they kicked him off the throne and kicked him out of his life. They, they did not want him. They shut him out. Uh, there's a little booklet that I read early in my Christian life from InterVarsity Press called My Heart Christ's Home. And uh, the person invites Christ into their life. And I highly commend you find it. We had it in circulating Big Apple Chapel a while ago. Um, and it, things are really good. And Christ wants to meet with them every day. And they, 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 the guy says, oh, this is wonderful. Let's do this again. And then he gets busy and he just runs out the door because he's you know, got to be somewhere. And... Uh, you know, months later, he you know, hears some noise and looks into the drawing room where he Jesus was supposed to meet and says, what, what, you're, you're still here? And he said, yeah, we, we were going to meet. Um, and the guy's all remorseful. And he starts opening up his life uh, to the Lord. And then uh, there's some stuff that he wants to hold back. And Jesus said, there's some stinky in that closet. I can't stay in, stay in the house with that. Uh, open it up and let me help you clean it up. And he does, and it'll happen ever after. <laughs> Of course, the booklet is a lot more eloquent than that. But notice Christ is outside their lives, knocking on the door. It's the door of their heart. It's where the decisions are made. And that's because he's not in their heart. All right? Their choice to exclude him. And by extension, he's not in their church. And there are lots of churches that meet are meeting that think they're doing so great. Um... But in God's estimation, uh, he's not there. Um, if, they, if they were there, they would be obeying his commands. They'd be making disciples above all. And they're doing almost everything but. Now, God is not desirous of anyone perishing, says Second Peter 3.9. Um, he's not slow concerning his promise of returning, but he's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the reason he doesn't want people to perish is because he's made each of us for a purpose. And we're fearfully and wonderfully made, says Psalm 139. And Ephesians 2.10 says we're, he has works that he prepared in advance for us to do. There's a purpose for us being here. And it's not to just live another day or work another day or even to propagate the race. Um, it's to live in such a way that he can give you glory, and thus glorify himself. It really is about his glory. Ephesians 3.10 says that. On Daily Truth Base, you can read about it. But he is long-suffering or patient with us because he wants all to come to repentance. Um, that verse alone could kill Calvinism, which says uh, only you know some people are saved. Um, we'll talk about that in a screen or two. So what Jesus does is... He warns of judgment, I spew out of my mouth. He reproves them. He brings them, brings things to light. Uh, that's why there's this, the verse right before verse 20 is, um, therefore, uh, whom I love, I reprove or rebuke. Uh, therefore, be zealous and repent. Change your mind about the stuff that I bring to light, which is not helpful to you, nor those around you, nor your future glory, nor me who created you. So he brings their sins to light. You think you're doing good, but you're really doing poorly. He offers a solution uh, or promise of a solution to their problems. You buy from him. Oh, uh, 
you know, the gold and silver, which and we saw that that is really the thing that he wants is something that he doesn't have, and that is having us listen and obey. Then he calls for repentance. Uh, oh, my love, I reprove, therefore be zealous and repent. And then he has to knock on their door to get their attention away from themselves and on to him. Um, so we could do a bunch of knock-knock jokes, but I will spare you. Um, but most of the time when people find out Jesus is the one that's knocking, they I'm busy, I'm not here, <laughs> go away, do not disturb. Um, but he wants that relationship because he loves us and cares for us. But we don't want it because we won't do the things that he said you need to do to have a relationship. Remember, relationships are reciprocal, and uh, we have to do the things that he wants. He has already taken the initiative. We have to respond, which happens to be worship. So it's you know, good for what ails you. Okay, just like unfaithful Israel, uh, so Jesus of the New Testament is the Yahweh of the Old Testament. Uh, when you see God on earth in the Old Testament, it's Jesus because uh, the Father doesn't... Uh, put his foot on the tainted, cursed earth until it's restored. And then you see God the Father actually uh, reside with us. Um, so in the Old Testament, God's bride is Israel and she's unfaithful. Uh, it's the union that God intended him, wanted to have with his people and gave them the rules of engagement and marriage. Uh, they ignored, and then they reaped the consequences that he had promised of them ignoring it. And same with the, the New Testament church. Uh, Jesus does not inhabit most believers. Uh, he's not at home there. They don't want him at home. But he still calls his unfaithful bride to return to him. Repent and return. Same thing. He wants a restored relationship with us, even though we have spurned and disrespected him. Uh, if that's not grace, I don't know what is. However, our sins and two types, commission, that's when you commit something that you shouldn't, omission, when you fail to do what you should, cause a separation. And Isaiah 59, 2 says your sins have caused a separation between you and God so that he can't hear you. Um, and it's, you turn a deaf ear to the law, he doesn't, well, he hears, but he doesn't answer. So what we have to do to respond, remember, essence of worship is response to revelation. We have to turn away to turn to. We have to turn away from what draws us and distracts us. We have to identify that, hence the need for the examined life. And then we need to return to focusing on him. We can't serve him and sin. We can't serve him and ourselves. Because if we're not serving him, we're serving the devil. Because our, ourselves in an unsanctified state are just doing Satan's will. Now, God first appeals to our minds or our conscience with cognitive commands. So much of modern churchianity, I was going to do worship, but it really isn't worship, is all about how you feel. Um, I remember I was up at the cloisters and uh, I happened to be there at a time when they were, there was a PhD student who was uh, giving a tour of it. And they have a section of a church or chapel and uh they talked about the theater sorry for those of you who are involved in theater big way um that was created by the catholic church to make people feel a certain way and it was to give them mystery and you know, uh, but if, if you think about it the early church didn't have churches uh they didn't even have synagogues they were kicked out they didn't have a meeting place they were meeting down by the river uh, they were meeting in homes. Uh, they didn't want them in the temple. Uh, then they would meet in catacombs. And, uh, the whole point was not to draw people with this pleasurable concert-like experience. Um, but God's appeal is really cognitive. Uh, you know, the Ten Commandments are not ten feelings. <laughs> they are ten things that you need to understand and do. So in uh, calling the Laodiceans uh, back to him, he is going to appeal to their minds. Uh, you have to hear his voice, and uh, the voice actually gives content. 
So, uh, I want to take a look at a passage of James. This is part of the application of uh, what to do to get back into a relationship to God, and the sermon could end after this. But, of course, uh, you know, I get paid for an hour, so you know, it's going to keep going. <laughs> but he, he addresses the believers who uh, actually had committed themselves to him and were being persecuted as a result and had scattered themselves. Um, but they were warring with each other. They were fighting with each other. Um, and that's really because God wasn't giving them what they wanted and they're trying to get it themselves. So uh, one of the early versions only calls them adulteresses. Uh, most versions call them adulterers and adulteresses because sin is an equal opportunity employer. <laughs> and uh, both guys and gals are being unfaithful to their partner. And then here's the first thing he says is cognitive. Don't you know? Uh, I didn't know that, Ollie. Uh, that friendship with the world is hostility or enmity with God. Then he logics them. When you see therefore, it's what it's there for. That's logic, the conclusion. Therefore, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. You have walked away. You have kicked him out and bolted the door behind him. Because your companion is not Jesus, it's the world. So the concept of a friend is a companion. And the uh, basis of most uh, relationships is commonality. And carnal Christians have more in common with the world that's under Satan's control than they do with Jesus. Um, and, you know, if you're an enemy of God, it's not good because he is going to resist you and fight against you. We're now going to come to one of the more difficult, uh, if not the most difficult passage uh, in the scripture. And uh, to try to figure it out, I did a bunch of reading and uh, I realized nobody has a really good answer. But uh, so I finally... When, when I was doing Daily Truth Base and I kind of crossed some of these conundrum passages, I thought I would uh, cheat and you know, see if I could find someone who resolved it for me. I could just skim a bunch of stuff and I didn't have to think. But after an hour or so of fruitless effort, I basically said, okay, I need to figure this out myself. And when I did that, it usually took me about half an hour to figure it out. And I just never learned my lesson. So this one I looked up, spent you know an hour, and... Uh, no luck. And then I said, okay, I, I've got to break it down. I still don't have, I know my solution is more right than anything I've read. It's, it's probably pretty correct. So here it goes. Here's the verse. Uh, it's two questions in your Bible. Uh, do you think that the scripture speaks in vain? And then when it says, it gives a quote, uh, he jealously longs for the spirit that dwells in us something like that. Uh, the problem is there is no verse in either Testament that says that. It's not a Bible verse. So uh, one of the people I did read uh, had broken the passage. Oops, next one, sorry. And into two spots. Do you think that the scripture speaks in vain? Now, what, what, have, what have we been speaking about? That Friendship with the world is hostility with God. So what's going to follow in verses 5 and 6 has to address the fact that they're fighting with each other and also an enemy of God. All right? And then verse 6 starts with, but it's continuing the thought, but changes it. Your understanding of this difficult passage not only has to satisfy the preceding context, but also satisfy the following context. And no one that I looked at actually tried doing an exegetical outline to tie things into their context. Um, I didn't actually do an exegetical outline, but um, I tied into the context. So uh, we've got the spirit that dwells in us. Uh, King James rightly puts it as a small s, as does the NIV. Um, 
it's talking about the human spirit. Uh, dozens of people say, oh, it's the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit is not dwelling in us, uh, in these believers. Uh, he's been kicked out as well. He's been grieved. He's been quenched. It's talking about the human spirit. Uh, then we have this word for, yeah, I'll do it up here. This is the actual, the Greek. Uh, the first word is towards jealousy. In, in verse 1, they were fighting. Now, jealousy, uh, King James translated it envy. The um, difference between those two is envy, you want to emulate someone. Um, you want what they have. So envy is emulate. Jealousy is a much more evil word. You don't want them to have it. Um, you want it. They have it. It makes you sad. And then you don't want it. So you'll, you'll see people, you know, uh, people will say, oh, oh I, you know, I got to eat at this place. I get reservations there. Oh, I'm so jealous. You know, it's um, so jealousy often involves a third person in a relationship. And it's a better translation here because instead of being faithful to God, they are faithful to someone else. So towards jealousy. So there's a word pros means to or towards this greatly desires it's another word for lusts the spirit which dwells in us so the king james actually had a decent translation the spirit that is in us is one naturally lusting toward jealousy all right that's so it's not a question there's no verse that says this but you, you you see in Romans and stuff that the carnal flesh, the carnal mind sets its mind on the things of the flesh, and it wants them. And in relation to other people, it wants them at their expense, which is basic selfishness. Uh, one of the modern versions is a little like uh, New King James it uses a capital S, and it says the spirit who dwells in us is a zealous jealous lover uh, but this word for jealousy is never used of God and uh, that's a bad translation uh, God jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us yeah that, that's not bad but let's go up here jealousy greatly desiring uh, is the spirit which dwells in us the spirit that dwells within us is named jealousy we want and we want to have and that makes us an enemy of God because we don't trust him to give it to us. We go and take it ourselves. Now, because this, this is a concept, most people miss this. The word is greatly desires. It's not just your basic word for life, but it's long, yearn, I want. And it's a, it's what's in us. And it goes towards something really bad. But he gives more grace. So the, this uh, literally it's but great he gives grace so it's emphasizing the fact that the amount of grace that he gives is really great because our problem is really great therefore he speaks or says uh, the above appearing this is the literal translation of the word that's used for pride you want to appear above everyone God resists and uh, that's the translation but the it's used of arranging in battle against. But the humble, so notice that the parallelism in the original, he gives grace. Instead of resisting them and fighting against them, he gives them grace, which is power and desire to do his will, power to overcome sin, power to endure. He gives that to the ones who are humble, who, you know, are like Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. The Laodiceans were very prideful. They thought they were doing great. They thought they were rich and wonderful, but he says, you know, you're naked and you're sick and you can't see. Therefore, God says, and this is out of Proverbs 3.34, he resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He gives more grace, and then he proves it with a scripture passage. He resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Really, drawing on God's grace is the key to um, responding to God and letting into your life and reigning in your life. 
which is what we're going to talk about next. Any questions on that? Okay. Therefore, oh, well, there's that logic stuff again. Because God gives more grace, we need to submit to him. Not my will, but thine be done. Do it his way. What's going to follow is very similar to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Major, major passage on sanctification. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, all the mercy he's shown to you in the previous 11 chapters, um, present yourselves to God as a living sacrifice, uh, which is your spiritual responsibility and service anyway. And then you can move to getting his good, acceptable, and perfect will. So, our first move of grace in our lives. The, you know, so one of the big things in you know the current generation is grace. You know, it's all about grace and grace is good. And you know, and in most people's view, in the more or less carnal church, it's you know, it's God saying that's okay. I already died for that. Uh, but grace is actually the power and desire to do God's will. And uh, as Paul said in uh, God said to Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, anyway, uh, three times I sought the Lord to remove this problem from my, uh, my life. And uh, he said, uh, my grace is sufficient. And then Paul responds, great, I'll glory in my infirmity that the power of God might rest upon me. Grace is power. If you don't understand that, there's a sermon called Praising Grace, the Coin of the Realm of Heaven. Excuse me, it's what allows us to do business in the spiritual realm. So the first move of grace is to have humility. Uh, and that's a true view of God in us. And this comes after the conviction of, uh, in James, of you're, you know, fighting against each other. You've got this jealous, lustful spirit. Um, and it's not getting you anywhere. And to really examine your life and understand that is a, function of grace and humility. So you have to be humble to get the grace, and then grace actually enables you to be uh, more humble. Then you've got yielding to him. This is the second move of grace. You now have power to resist the devil, because the devil is the one who incites you with these bad desires. Or it could be for a good thing, but in a bad way. So you need to resist him. And when you resist him, just like with Jesus, uh, he will flee from you. Uh, probably doesn't run away that fast from us, but uh, he waits for a more opportune time. But he's you know, realizing, okay, this isn't going to work. I'll have to wait till a more opportune time in our own lives. So we need to resist the devil versus yielding to him and resisting the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you know, we get it backwards. Instead of resisting the devil, we resist the Holy Spirit. But drawing on his power and grace, uh, should have put in here uh, Hebrews 4.12. Uh, Therefore, let's boldly, with a clear conscience, approach the throne of grace that we may receive mercy uh, and grace to help in time of need. So doing that, when Satan realizes, okay, he's kind of all uh, graced up with God, um, armored with it, then he will flee with you. Now, the devil is not actively keeping you from doing verse 8. You need to draw near to God. If Revelation 3, 20, you have to open the door. Then you can have fellowship with God. If you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. He took the very first initiative by... And then we need to respond. We have to take the initiative to seek God. He doesn't make us seek us on, you know, his own. In the process of seeking God, you need to cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Interesting, the order of this is first, you have to deal with the physical on the outside. That's because of the ruts in our brain that running they actually override any mental spiritual st stimulus people are addicted to pleasure uh addicted to drugs getting that dopamine hit um they they basically put a rut in their brain 
and it's the easiest way for the electrical impulses to run. Well, we need to make the decision to stop it, but God gives us the grace to do that. And when we can stop doing what's in the physical realm, it which overrides the physical, then we can work, do the work of purifying, sanctifying our hearts, uh, cl cleansing them of the impure values and act, uh, desires. But most Christians are double-minded. They want to, um, you know, have a foot in each world and get the benefits of each, but it, they don't get the benef full benefits of neither, particularly the spiritual. Uh, purity or holiness on the inside is crucial for uh, being holy and getting blessed by God. If you have cleansed up the inside, then the outside is no longer a problem. It's victory. And one of the next things you have to do, in 21, he talks about the one who's victorious will get blessings in the future. Revelation 3.21. This verse I used to put on the birthday cards for my kids and uh, their friends. <laughs> Lament and mourn and weep, let your laughter return to mourning and your joy to gloom. Uh, it would be funny because I just put the verse and then people would look it up and, you know, ha ah. um, But if you put it in its context, when you have purified your hearts and you think back of what you have done and your values have really changed, what used to give you pleasure is really grief. We kick ourselves. I'm sure you all have things that you kick yourself for. You know, you know I wish I had done that. And, you, know, um, you know, God can take away that pain. But when you really do this purified heart stuff, your values have totally changed and you really disdain what you used to delight in. Bill? Yes. Sorry, just back to that previous screen. I guess this is something we, or at least some of us, um, have to do continuously. Um, Once you change the value, it you, you don't need to go back to it. Of course, you know, you you can stray from drawing upon God's uh, strength. You can stray from uh, you know, following through on your intention. You know, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Uh, the reason that is, is because we don't watch, be on guard, and pray like the disciples in the garden. Uh, they basically failed when they ran away because they hadn't spent the time fortifying themselves. But if you, every time you sin, you kind of break down the wall and you've got to rebuild it. So the idea is that if you really have cleansed your hands and purified your hearts, you no longer have the desire to do that stuff because your desires have changed. It's only when you let yourself get run down, your physical resources or you know, you've exhausted them, uh, you've ignored the spiritual resources, then you have to kind of redo that. Romans 12, 2 uh, says, stop being conformed to this world. All right, there's the cleanse your hands, you sinners. Stop it. Then be metamorphosized, caterpillar to butterfly, you don't go back to being a caterpillar unless you're related to seeing. Uh, and then you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you can experience God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. And as you're experiencing that, and God is giving you grace to be content in all the circumstances, uh, you're not doing the backsliding thing. Uh, Paul told the Ephesians, you were taught that you put off were transformed, renewed, transformed, and then that you put on. That was that's the way he got people to do this. So uh, the whole idea of two steps forward, one step back, the title of a book by a uh, famous preacher, uh, is clearly not God's ideal. Um, it, and then the, it, I'm going to one of the next sermons that's coming up is one on victory. Once you have the victory. You don't go back and surrender the ground, because if you do, you know you're that you're worse off than you were at the beginning. Um, when I was a very young Christian, um, I read uh, the, the Normal Christian Life by Watchman Nee, who is usually very very good, 
and a couple spots that you can fault him. Another book by that I picked up with it at some book table when I was in college uh, was The Victorious Christian Life, to realize that victory is possible. If I have done Romans 8 and reckoned myself dead to sin and alive to God, and I really believe that, then when sin, you know, drops its hanky in front of me, <laughs> perfumed as it might be, uh, I am not attracted to it because, so there is Romans 1, 9, I'm mean, not Romans, 1 John 1, 9. If we, if we do sin, and if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. But look at that last part, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's not, the he's cleansing us from the, the doing of it as well. So yeah, it is iterative, but it is, uh, there is a victory that's available to us. And most people do not live the victorious Christian life and very few people teach it, but that's what the scripture teaches. You know, the, the, the kind of the first time I realized, boy, they're just saying to put off the stuff. And, to, you know, it's like you don't need God, that. If God tells you to do that, you you have to be able to obey his commands. It's a good question. And uh, it gets better and easier over time. It, it's just like, you know, people get up early and they go running. I had to do that once upon a time. And uh, it gets easier and easier to do it. And then you wake up and, you know, you don't go running. Your, your body says, hey, come on, let's, let's, let's get a move on. But it's cold out there. It's snowing. It's raining. Um, it just gets easier and easier. If you backslide, then it becomes harder and harder to get back into the routine. And that's where like programming your robot comes in. If you have reprogrammed 95% of your actions are automatic. You don't consciously think about all these things. Uh, just sit you next to a bag of potato chips and see what happens. <laughs> you have no idea what that hand is doing. How did, how did, how did those potato chips get in my mouth? I, I, you know, it's, but if you have basically decided that, you know, this is really bad for me and might kill me, you know, the bag can stay there until it gets stale until the next time you backslide and then you heat them up and they taste good anyway. Make nachos out of them. All right. Uh, let's move on to God getting our attention. Okay. God gets, how does God get our attention? How does he actually knock? Yeah, we, that doesn't happen. Um, by the Holy Spirit of truth, the word of truth, and his body constituted by truth that bring things to light, right? The Holy Spirit's trying to do it. His word clearly does it because the Holy Spirit and his word work together. And the body should also be part of it because we have the responsibility to encourage, teach and encourage and reprove and rebuke. So also, that's the, you want to learn at the lower volume. So you know, in your quiet time, ask God uh, to you know search me and you know, see if there's any this pleasing way made me lead me in the way of life everlasting. Uh, this month I've been going through Proverbs and on my phone highlighting verses that I had memorized or wanted to memorize. Um, I was almost at a point where each day I could think of the proverb of the day when I was in the shower and I wouldn't have to read it because I could kind of know it. Um, so um, it, based on the encouragement of the body as people are working on memorizing verses, I said, yeah, I should uh, get my act together in that area. So, uh, one of my, a verse that I like out of Proverbs, not like, but I took to heart out of Proverbs 5, 21 is, uh, for man's ways are in full view of the Lord and he ponders or examines, uh, all his paths. Well, at the end of Proverbs 4, it talks about us examining our way first and, uh, cleaning up our act because if we don't do it in Proverbs 4, God will do it in Proverbs 5. And, uh, you know, it's much better if we take the initiative to do that. The other thing that happens is the reproofs of life. Um, so a reproof is, you know, bringing to life. And how that works is God lets us reap the consequences, the conflicts or judgment for our disobedience, positive or negative. So the covenant, it's got positive and negative consequences. So he set up the world 
not that he micromanages every decision, but the rules are that if you do what's good, you get good. If you do what's bad, you get bad. Real simple, not too hard to understand. Then, like I quote, mentioned earlier, Proverbs, uh, not Proverbs, Isaiah 59, 2, uh, he doesn't answer our prayers as we would like. He always answers, you know, yes, no, maybe, or yes, no, not yet. Um, but uh, he, so he does answer, but he doesn't give us what we want. But then uh, he also answers our prayers, gives us what we want, like quail in the wilderness. But as the rest of the verse says, he sent leanness to their souls. Um, so what that means is your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. You're not satisfied. You're not content. You're unable to enjoy the fruits of your labor. And the reason for that is because you were more focused on the thing than him. And it wasn't about his will. It was about your will. And thus you are not pleasing in his sight. You are not good in his sight. I remember a guy... Uh, uh, after I graduated from college, I was in a nav pro navigator program, and uh, one of the uh, couples that was leading it, uh, went about a year afterwards, uh, left the navigators. And I just remember talking with the guy, and he said that he had a really attractive wife, at least uh, with the beauty and charm part, um, but apparently wasn't exactly the most uh, God-fearing and he said, God, he prayed for his wife. God gave him this wife, but sent leanness to his soul. It's just really, really sad. Um, and this happens to us. And, I mean, it happens with people sometimes when they jump jobs. <laughs> oh, it's going to be better. And they're out of the frying pan into the fire. Uh, he answered the prayer, uh, let you have it. But uh, it wasn't what was best for you. Which is why it's really good to leave the decision to God. Don't force it based on your corrupt worldly values that you don't even know are corrupt and unsanctified. Uh, particularly the big decisions of life, they're going to have long-term effects. Be tread really carefully. Understand exactly why you're doing it. Uh, Solomon, as he reflected on life, observed that uh, you really need to please God. He tried everything did everything, had it all. And what do you say? It's vanity, emptiness, meaningless, a grasping of the wind. You ever tried grasping the wind? I mean, it's like you, you get nothing. Um, so he asked the question, after he built all this stuff, what does a man get have for all his labor and for the striving of his heart? That's where our strivings come from, our values for which he has toiled under the sun, for all his days are sorrowful and his work burdensome. And even in the night, his heart has no rest. Contrast to Psalm 23, it makes me lie down in green pastures, he restores my soul. This is meaningless, it's purposeless, it's pointless. And concludes, well, there's nothing better for a man or woman that they should eat and drink and that your soul should enjoy good in his labor. But this, you saw, is from the hand of God. It's a gift of God. 313, he repeats that. It's a theme that shows up a number of times. Nothing better than to be able to work and uh, enjoy the fruits of that. Uh, I was listening as I was driving yesterday to Larry Kudlow on the radio. He was a, uh, oh, I think... Chairman of President uh, Trump's economic advisors. He's talking to a senator from North Dakota. And uh, there is in North Dakota a state park named after an individual, the only state park thusly named uh, Teddy Roosevelt State Park. And Teddy Roosevelt wrote, there's a book in there of his uh, autobiography. And he talked about the good people of the state of North Dakota. And he talked about the Oh, glory in their work. Um, and it was, Kudlow was making an action to that this new bill doesn't have any workfare in it. And the senator brought up the fact that there's a phrase in there about Roosevelt observed in these people, the glory of the work and 
the happiness of their lives and the joy of their lives you know glory in their work and happiness in their lives uh, that's the way it's supposed to be we were made to work as most of you know work is worship um, God gave Adam a job to do in the garden tended a giant garden uh, I don't know if he had to deal with the sheep and wolves um, and then uh, when we get to the kingdom there's work to be done there be it ruling or uh, gathering tribute and farming or making your wine uh, so uh, we kind of want to escape doing that but uh, you, you know kind of want to find your passion and then be passionate about it so there's nothing better and you should enjoy good in your labor and it's from the hand of God then he says a little later for God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to the man who is good or pleasing in his sight that's where it comes from of course you have to you know study and read too but to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting um, that he may give to the one who is good before God uh, this also is vanity and grasping for wind it says Solomon but it's also the right principle and right answer he's just not doing it because Solomon is looking at life under the Sun and he wanted to find out what was good to do under the Sun and then it isn't until he gets to the end of the book where he looks at what happens above the Sun that we get fear God to keep his commandments because is the whole duty of man but this is the work experience of many many people it's not the joy that God could intend it to do even hard work can be joy and all hard work is profit okay so God gives resist the proud but gives grace to the humble the problem of the Laodiceans is that they were proud um, they had an incorrect view of themselves and God and that made them insensitive to their own needs they did not know that they were blind and poor and naked and it also makes them insensitive to God because they don't need him look what my hand has done thus independence not living in dependence upon God is the essence of sin not living in obedience means you are basically making your own rules for life independence essence of sin uh, doing what you think you'll give you pleasure even though God said that is not best for you from eating the apple to you know relationships and stuff uh, that's independence from God and then failing to do what God wanted and he wants us to do it because it's in our best interest Moses said in Deuteronomy these it's not an idle thing for you to keep these words these are your life for by them your days in the uh, land will be multiplied and you'll have plenty and you'll be able to uh, rejoice but self-sufficiency is the opposite of dependence upon God I can do it yeah and we can grit you know grind it out cut it out and do it but then we think ah oh, my hand has gotten this no it's like God allowed you to have it or Satan allowed you to have it and uh, I've mentioned this before and over the years I've gotten a lot of objection over it but it's true Satan answers more prayers than God does because most people aren't obeying God so when their prayers get answered who's answering them it's Satan to keep them away from seeking and doing God's will if you weren't seeking God's will and doing it and holding it with an open hand it's demonic influence that is driving you not this Holy Spirit so self-sufficiency eventually leads to self-deception where you think you're doing good when you're actually doing bad we delusionally think we're serving God but we're really serving ourselves and ultimately we're serving Satan yeah it's like and then we're, we're stuck in the darkness so God does not want us to be stuck in the darkness so he knocks on the door of our life to get our attention and uh, this is just a there's so much in this little passage so we're, we're spending time going through it uh, the first words just totally blow apart a um, 
one of the cornerstones of Calvinism. It spells TULIP. Uh, there's a series called Calvinism for Dummies on Truth Base, where I take the five points. Uh, total depravity, uh, unconditional election. Total depravity means you're totally bad, you can't do anything right. Uh, but it's because of our trespasses and sins. It's not because of original sin, if you look at Ephesians 2. The second point is unconditional election, that God picks some people to go to heaven and others to go to hell. That's also totally wrong, because whenever you look at predestination, it's to a reward, and it's optional. Uh, to you, a limited atonement. Christ only died for the elect. He didn't die for everybody. God so loved the world that he died. That, you know, anyone, get it. Here's another anyone passage. Uh, unlimited atonement is the biblical perspective. Limited atonement is the error perspective. It's not limited to a special group, to you, ally. Irresistible grace. God wants you saved, you're going to be saved regardless. That is so wrong. And we'll see this, that you, there's going to be number screens on showing that, yeah, you can resist God, and most people do. And then P, preservation of the saints. Uh, that is talk about, like, once saved, always saved, which is also true, um, but it's a limited meaning of salvation. It just relates to justification, but the actual uh, spiel on it from Calvinism is uh, those who are elect will persist in doing good works. And if they don't persist in good works, it shows that they really weren't elect, which is nothing more than salvation by justification by works in a bad sense. Uh, yeah, I realize that's kind of hard to follow, but uh, if it concerns you, go look it up on Daily Truth Base. Is yeah. James 3.20? Oh, this, now we're back to Revelation 3.20. Yeah, I, I normally I put these in different. There we go. Thank you very much. Okay. If anyone hears my voice, if anyone has ears to hear, any God's given all of us ears. He's dug, dug a hole so we can hear. Christ is delighted so we can do his will. The actual word in the psalm is, uh, is it, I don't know if it's 16 or not. It's something like, uh, my ears you have dug. <laughs> so it's to be, give us ears to have an opening into our brain. And you know, it comes through our eyes when we read and through our ears when we hear. So uh, these are the most disobedient, ungodly, carnal, people rights, worldly believers. People rights uh, is actually what Laodicea means. And uh, that's a thing that is, we're the rights of people, meaning you know, we do what we want. Um, the only right we really have is to die for our sins. Uh, well, the other rights we should yield and uh, trust God and seek his will on getting the stuff that we want. Now, the thing that should be obvious is that not everybody in Laodicea responds. Some will, and some won't respond. And Jesus is there knocking, wanting entree to their lives, but people don't open the door. They're not worshiping God because the essence of worship is response to revelation. Worship is not singing a song. You know, come let us worship and bow down. You know, you know, come let us worship and serve God and do his will and obey him. But they don't make songs like that. Um, it's Abraham going on a hike with his son Isaac to kill and sacrifice Isaac, where worship first shows up in the Bible, Genesis uh, 22. Daily Truth Base gives you a little more of the background to it. Radical distinction from pagan worship, which was doing what feels good. Um, it didn't really feel good knowing that his son was going to die. Well, anyway, that's another story for another time. It's actually a sermon, not a story. So some will respond, some won't respond. And grace is resistible. People do it all the time. And what I'm going to convince you of is uh, a guy, Adam Clark. He was a bishop uh, in England um, at the time when American Revolution, 1876, he was ministering in that time frame. And uh, he uh, 
wrote on this and free will and stuff like that and on the next screen I've kind of excerpted it but I will uh, anyone is listening God speaking is anyone listening uh, then you have to open the door we'll look at that and then we'll look at what it means to have uh, Christ come in and, and uh, I will and eat with us and us being his host and then he will eat with he will eat with us and we will sup with him uh, and a lot of commentators will basically say uh, us uh, basically hosting him is what happens in this life and then we eat with him in the future yeah you, you can make a case for that but it's, it's pretty good but uh, this next thing is we need to hear his voice again that's a cognitive thing note that responding to God is dependent upon some revelation of himself or a revelation of his will so such a response is a repentance it's a mind change it's the word for repentance change of mind is rooted in faith or belief and that faith has got to be in something that God has communicated preferably in writing <laughs> in by the Spirit of God writing the truth objective revelation I've spoken sadly to a number of people who have gotten some dream or some voice and are doing things that are very contrary to the scripture convinced that they're doing God's what God said because God spoke to them and you know you're sanctified by the truth thy word is truth God exalts his truth above all else um, you know Satan twist you know, he's the one who speaks more in visions and stuff like that um, to get people away from God's word so response has to be rooted in something that God has revealed uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by a voice in the night oh no it doesn't say that <laughs> faith comes by hearing the word of God that's why the, the word is profitable for all things it's a, not one jot or chittle little, little mark is going to pass away until all is fulfilled and I'll leave you with this thought uh, this is thought that we're going to explore again when we look at the seven basic questions how do you know what's true um, God speaks in such a way that we can understand and respond uh, of course there might be you know, babies can't do that and they die uh, there, there might be people that are mentally deficient when they're born um, but and God can save them by grace uh, but for the most part he created us so we could understand his will and respond it he made us with that capacity and this little you should really be able to explain this concept uh, once you can prove that the world was created uh, it's the only way we're going to know by your creator and only by his communication can we know truth a God who would have the power to create would also have the power to communicate with his creatures it should be really obvious that that's true all right if he created us and he wants us to do something uh, he would tell us what he wants us to do so God who could create could have the power to communicate and would do so if he had a purpose or plan for a relationship with him and the answer is yes he does have a purpose and plan and he's told us what it is in the scripture and it, the, the, you know, to cut to the chase on that one it's to uh, live with live for him and enjoy him forever it's to get glorified by him and thus give him glory uh, but that's going to come up later so you can read ahead if you want um, I'm going to be quoting a guy that wrote a couple centuries ago yeah Adam Clark right there uh, it's a little difficult to understand but I will translate it to you but uh, you have to hear his voice and then you open the door and then you can live with him happily ever after in this life and also in the next okay any last questions before we close who's there it's me Jesus Jesus who <laughs> Jesus Christ Lord and Master oh um, just a minute <laughs> let me clean up the place before you come in <laughs> we want to live so we can have him in every day let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you that you are such a wonderful God that you would uh, want a relationship with those who have disrespected you spurned you ignored you um, live as enemies of you 
um, because you made us for a purpose and you want us to achieve that purpose, but you won't force us to. You give us the option because you created us with free will to say yay or nay uh, to your promptings, to your spirit, to your word, to the life that you have planned for us. And to say nay to it is just really stupid. Uh, Satan wants us to do that. It's satanic. Um, and your spirit wants us to uh, answer you. So we pray that we would not grieve him or quench him, but would be responsive to him. And uh, want you fully in our life, in every aspect of our life. Uh, because that is the only way we will achieve your good, acceptable, and perfect will in this life and the next. Thank you for the examples we have in Scripture of uh, <clears throat> people and nations, or Israel, who uh, did the wrong thing and suffered consequences. And we have, unfortunately, only a scattered few examples of people who uh, responded in a way that pleased you, and you blessed them when they did. So thank you for your word that guides us into uh, the blessings that uh, we would consider, if we saw it from your perspective, the absolute best for us. And thank you for being a guide who wants that for us. In Christ's name we give thanks. Amen. Mm -hmm.